join us uh, live can join us. So welcome everyone uh, to today's Survivor Circle session. Uh, my name is Becky Perkins. I'm the Survivor Support Specialist with Zero Abuse Project. Um, we're very excited to welcome you today. Um, this is our second time using Zoom, uh, so we're hopeful that all will work well again as it did uh, before. So we're very happy to have you with us. Um, during the, the session, the presentation today, um, you'll be able to see our presenters. I'll take myself off the screen. Uh, there is a chat feature. If you um, kind of hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen, there's something called chat there. You can click on that. You have the option to type in a question or a comment. You can have everyone see that. So uh, me, the, the two presenters, and everyone attending, or you can just have um, the, the question or comment be viewable to um, you know us and, the, and the, the presenters if you don't want everyone to see it. So there are options there in the chat. Um, you will not be able to, to share your audio or your, your video, which um, most folks probably prefer. <laughs> so again, welcome. We're very glad to have you here. And I will go ahead and turn it over to our lead presenter for today, um, Kayessa Kay, welcome. Thank you, Becky. It's always a pleasure. And thank you for doing the moderation for this. It's fabulous. I am so glad to be here. And I thank all of you for coming back again. And this is about poetry this time, transforming trauma through the creative art of writing using poetry. Because I believe, and my life is testimony to the fact that finding the right poem at the right time can save your life. And writing the right poem at the right time can help you live your life and live through just about anything. Okay, anything for sure. When I was a little girl, I found poetry in a different way. I didn't find it through school. I didn't find it through classroom. My father would bring home these big boxes from the auction full of books. And once I got you know, to read and tip and mitten, but I started reading a little bit more, I just would pick up it and read it. And I would read things I didn't quite understand. You know, I found Walt Whitman. I celebrate myself and sing myself. And he wrote, I sound my barbaric yacht over the rooftops of the world. So here, this little kid, brutally abused through childhood, walking around going, yop, yop, yop. <laughs> You see, I knew that someday I would be free, and I knew it because of the poetry I found. And the first book of poetry that I found was called Sonnets from the Portuguese by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And one of the things I loved so much um, was that before she wrote that, she had written, my future shall not hold fair my past. She thought the best of her life was over. She thought it was done. And then she met Robert Browning. They went to Italy and she wrote sonnets from the Portuguese, which is what we remember about her. Well, one of the many things that we remember about her. So the best of her life hadn't even started yet when she thought that the best of her life was over. So to me, that's part of what poetry does. It reminds me that there's more. And it makes me feel more fully alive with words. So I want to introduce you to Meredith Heller. And I found her because one of her poems just popped up on my computer. We still don't know how it happened. And I just immersed myself in her works because she's truly um, someone who walks the walk and talks the talk. I'm going to share a couple of my poems. But first, I want her to have a chance to talk about what she does because I just Meredith you're here now and I just feel like you embody what it means to live your life as a poem mm, thank you so much thank so you so much so would, would you want to talk about who you are and how poetry strengthens you to go deeper and live your life more fully absolutely I love how you say that um that I embody um living life as a poem that's so mm -hmm. beautiful when I first started 
um, teaching poetry workshops uh, about 30 years ago. I was working in Boulder, Colorado, and I was actually at the writing program at Naropa. Um, Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg started that writing program, the School of Disembodied Poetics. And here I am going, wait a minute, it's taken me my whole life to try to get in my body. What's up with the disembodied stuff? But anyway, I was there doing it. And um, there were aspects of the program, I would say like any writing program that really didn't work for me. Um, and so I went back to my original vision when I first applied to that school, which was, I was hiking one day and had an epiphany. Writing poetry is what saved my life as a teenager when I had left home around 12, 13 years old and raised myself. And so I had this epiphany that if I could get to the kids who were like I was, at that time in my younger life, um, very creative, very open, very connected to the thrum of life, not being met or tapped in the school environment. And if I could get to those kids who were like I was before they gave up on themselves and before they gave up on the world, then everything I had been through would be more meaningful. So I was at Naropa, not loving the program, remembered my original vision, went into the alternative high schools where there were both at-risk kids and highly gifted kids and created poetry programs. And the first workshops that I taught were called Living Poetry. So that's where, when you said live my life as a poem, that's what it was, living poetry. Two things, how do I bring my poems to life and how do I live my life poetically? So I just love that you opened with that. Thank you. We have a connection because I lived for about a decade in Colorado. Right. And so as you're talking about these things, I'm seeing them in my mind's eye. Mm -hmm. What would you like to share as your first poem for us? Didn't you say you were going to share a poem first? Well, I was kind of chickening out, Meredith. <laughs> do, you, do you want to chicken out or do you want to chicken no, out? No, no, no. I'll go ahead. Do you want me to go first and read one of my little ones? Okay. Because you talked about um, childhood and wanting to go forward and um, sort of help the children who were like you were, right? There's some of us just born creative. We can't help it. It's in us. We're born with a really strong connection to nature. It's just in us from the very beginning. And um, I was one of those. You were one of those. And my guess is that probably everyone listening to us and drawn to us would come from that kind of framework, a really deep, deep framework. But when I was a little girl, I used to sleep outside whenever I could. I did not want to sleep in the house. So from March to October, I would be outside sleeping on the porch under the stars looking up. And this poem comes from that. It's called Little Dipper. Orion's belt never beat anybody. Shining brightly on new moon nights, an arrow from his quiver pointed to the blinking star where we all began. Little Dipper, Big Dipper, Cassiopeia. We slept under the stars from April to October, couch pillows beneath us, covered in thin blankets, as the low-voiced bullfrogs croaked our lullaby. The fish splashed deep, and a sweet honeysuckle breeze would mingle with the constant clover, the freshly mown grass. 10,000 twinkling stars swirled overhead, lighting our way home. That's it. That's the star. That's my star. Felt God resting up there, looking with love on the lake. Somewhere there was love in the lake, in the stars. Orion's belt never beat anybody. Yeah. 
That is so beautiful. Kayasa, thank you. And you're it's from that childhood place. I, I have a book of poetry called Lakewood 14, and they're oh. all from that childhood place. Yes, absolutely. Um, I love how you weave in that you begin and end with his belt never hit anybody. So you let us in to the pain that um, that you grew up with and you and by doing that you also show us where you find refuge in nature exactly. and exactly. that's such an impart uh, an Im important part I think of writing poetry is the journey that happens when we start writing I always say the way knows the way the poem knows the poem there's there's something that happens when we start a piece and work through the the journey and the process of that piece and we come out somewhere new we come out more whole more integrated um i love how you had you the arrow from his quiver the arrows from his quiver that was gorgeous i felt like those arrows um, were part of what you talked about in terms of um, having a vision for the future and going forward. And there was something about his arrows in his quiver that even though you came from um, a traumatic past, there were arrows pointing you to the next place. And then you said, we, we slept, we, and that was you and Orion sleeping out there. What a gorgeous piece. Gonna read my poetry to you all the time, Meredith. All you day, day. It. bring it, <laughs> I want it. That's amazing. Yeah. We had a comment just thanking you for sharing that, okay, so. Oh, thank you, thank yeah. you. Well, I when I first started writing, I, I started writing poetry when I was like seven, you know, I, I tennis shoes squeak when wet <laughs> you know I, that's literally um but um I wrote everything as if it happened to other people or as if it and and I also then when I got a little bit farther along and I started exploring my pain I wrote so many poems that were really painful for other people to read I was really processing through this grief and then I got to this different place and it was, it was like, yes, that grief is there, but there's also something else, something very powerful that lifts me out of it. And, and as I wrote more and more, I found myself more and more able to lift out of grief through writing and through being really authentic and really true to myself. Yeah. Yes, that's it. That's the key right there. I think that um, I relate to that a lot. Um, I, I started writing short stories when I was about five. I would lock myself in the basement of the house I grew up in, and I wrote stories all day. Um, I created entire families of brothers and sisters because I wasn't very close to my sister. Um and so I created a dynamic of community that something in me yearned for. Then I started writing poetry um, for real, like really digging in when I was about 12 and I had left home and my trauma and my pain was um, all consuming. And writing poetry, I'm also a singer songwriter. So writing poetry and writing song lyrics that contained the the music which was the carrier of emotion for me <clears throat> um to have such overwhelming and consuming feeling that is so big and so traumatic and so undoing and to find the words to name the unnameable 
and to track ourselves through that pain by writing, finding the words, putting them down, and beginning to sculpt them gives us the tools to think about what's going on, to ground and anchor ourselves in reflection to what we're writing. We know ourselves now rather than just being in this amoebic field of overwhelm. And so I think that what you're saying and what we're both speaking to is this process. It's an alchemical process of writing whereby we weave ourselves back into wholeness. That is exactly right. I, I want to share one more poem called Windstorm. And the reason I'm sharing it is because of what you just said because I, I was involved. Sometimes when you have traumatic childhoods, we are lucky and we dive right into a great relationship and it's fabulous. And sometimes we're still working things out. So I had a, a problematic first marriage and I wrote this poem while I was still in the marriage. So this is a, and, and a little bit of a an alert warning. This has a little bit of potentially troublesome things. So put on your armor. You ready? Windstorm. The sapphire and diamond forever ring gleams as that bloody fist thrusts through our bedroom door again. I pull our down comforter around my shoulders, surrounded by feathers, incapable of flight. It's my fault. I built my nest in a hurricane's path. Screams pierce my ears of my imagined infidelities, shrieks as my true love's scar tissues shed tears, obsidian raindrops, hard, dark, pounding, hands that once caressed me like mist on the water, those feather-like touches, those hands clenched into fists, all the soft prunings careen as those two claws slam toward me. Tomorrow, he'll be so sorry. Apologies will soften the madness to mush, and he'll mend the door. He'll make my breakfast. He'll say his passion overflows for me, and I will kiss the eyelids. I will pet the muscular back. I will rub rose-scented lotion into those tired feet, but then I will take flight before the rainbow fades. Say the last line again before what? Before the rainbow fades. Rainbow I used to be a house manager at a shelter, a domestic violence shelter, immediately after that marriage. That's that's what I did. And and that was the secret. There, you know, there's this whole cycle of violence that can happen. And take if you can make yourself take flight during that happy time before the violence building starts again, you can get out. Beautiful. Yeah. That's so, this is such an but, important piece. But that poem helped me get out of a relationship that was killing me. Right, because you you saw what was happening because you could name it. And I exactly. love how you wove the theme of the feathers, how you built the nest out of the feathers. And yet the feathers were a trap because you were incapable of flight. And then you saw what was happening. You continued to love. You pet the back. You put the rose on the feet. You mm -hmm. kissed the eyelids while it was good. And then you would take flight. Right. So my question and for you in this piece mm -hmm. would be what allowed you that time to have the courage and grow the wings that time? Because when you write it, you see it differently. When you write what's happening, a part of you that's very, very, very strong sees what's happening in a new way. And so if you're writing about past trauma, you I believe you actually fold time and go back and lift up and help yourself out of it in an emotional way. And if you're writing about something current, 
you're gaining the strength you need. I really believe every word is a blessing and that that's a big part of the power of poetry and what it's done for me. Absolutely. I've seen it happen for so many people. I totally agree. I think that what you're speaking to is what I often refer to as um, meeting deep psyche when we mm -hmm. write. So exactly. we touch into this place, this this reservoir of everything and everyone we've ever been and something that's bigger. You said the strong part of ourselves, yeah, that's right. something that's bigger and deeper that is connected to our resilience exactly. the part of us that has enabled us to survive um mm -hmm. and and i i really think it's it's life force mm -hmm. and we're able to to connect with that and tap into that when we write and that's where the metaphors come from that's where mm -hmm. Like I always say to the people who come to my workshops, write to discover something you didn't know you knew. And, and when we do that, that's when our writing becomes a living thing. And that's what keeps bringing us back to it because there's something to discover. Um, that's going to be the treasure from having dug into usually what hurts exactly and you can't dodge it right you can't dodge it and still access that life force to be fully alive i believe you have to be willing to face and incorporate all aspects of what you've been and where you've been and poetry is a, a really great way of doing that and I can't wait to hear one of your poems. I can, I'm practically jumping out of my chair here. Let's do it. Yeah, I just I wanted it. to touch really quick that you had brought up <clears throat> before being mm -hmm. um, writing from authenticity, being authentic. Yes. I think that's the other gift of writing is that the more we show up for ourselves and be true to exactly what's here. You know, like mm -hmm. I always say, if you feel like shit, write about that feeling. You know, if you if you're flying, write about that feeling, write about what's true, being honest with ourselves. And the more that we show up, this is what I'm really feeling. We that echoes through our life. That becomes the barometer, what it feels like to be true to ourselves is when you find someone who speaks it for you. I mean, when you find something that's says what you needed to say and couldn't find the words for. It's so miraculous. It's so beautiful. It's a lifeline. Absolutely. It's a lifeline. Okay. I'm trying to figure out which piece to share. It's very, it's very tricky. Yeah. I think I'm going to share, tell it to the river. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pull that up on my screen and, um, and, I love how you prefaced your piece with there may be some triggers. So I want to say there may be some triggers in this. Everybody piece. take a deep breath. Let's take a deep breath together. Breathe in. Yeah. And maybe um, if it's comfortable for you mm -hmm. to place a hand on your heart, mm -hmm. a hand on your belly, somewhere to help you connect to yourself and to ground, if that's comfortable. And let's just take a, a, a moment to ground ourselves together. Okay. Because we just heard one tough poem. We're going to hear another tough poem. So take a deep breath. Hold it. Be back. And wait. And come into your heart center. Into your strength. You're perfectly good and always have been. You're perfectly protected. That was a poem. <laughs> Tell it to the river. The barn on Trevilla Road 
along the Potomac River in Maryland, where I made a home at 13, slept on the floor with an old sleeping bag from Salvation Army, hung on a torn lace curtain in the window where the glass had long been broken. I ate stale rye bread from the trash, spent my quarters on a tin of Medaglia d'Oro coffee, dark and sweet, like the beekeeper boy I kissed behind the hive for a jar of local honey, my skin buzzing, tell it to the river. I was 15, living in a log cabin in the, in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, Virginia. No electricity, no running water, with Willie, 28, who kicked around in a pair of red Converse high tops, pinned me to the hood of his station wagon and held his hand over my mouth so no one would hear me scream, tell it to the river. I made bracelets from copperhead snakes I found dead on the road, taught myself to tan their skins by slicing them open, scooping out their guts. Once I found a baby bird inside, once a handful of fleshy eggs, I'd nail the skins to a wooden board, salt them and leave them to dry in the sun cut the skin into strips, sew them around a piece of rope attached to a tube of beads I'd made in a pattern called peyote stitch I'd learned from the women on the Navajo reservation. I'd sell them in town for 20 bucks, which was a lot of food money back then. Tell it to the river. The boy I met one summer, whose skin was made of cinnamon sticks, who sat all day at the water's edge, singing in a language no one knew but me. We watched the water braid the light in helixes. We made love in a circle of pines under a full moon, and three days later we found his body suicide. I crawled inside myself and didn't speak for many months when I was a teen on my own, trading my sex for survival, my love, <clears throat> my love for belonging, tell it to the river. My friend Annalise, 88-year-old Swiss artist who simply is not old. She is tiny and strong and determined as a beetle, hands constantly making things come to life, paper and glass, paint and clay. She keeps bees, feeds the raccoons, cheats at cards, cuts is worse than I do when she loses, yodels expertly and rides downhill every morning morning on her kick scooter to swim in the pool. She was my first true friend. She found me when I was a lone wolf, my skin chewed raw, my fur full of sparks, and slowly she shaped me like one of her clay pots into a human being with space inside for homemade soup. Tell it to the river. To all the bards along my path who wonder where I go when I go, who know me as the wolf-hearted woman with one eye dark and one eye bright, one that looks inward and one that looks out, one that draws you closer while the other pushes you away, tell it to the river. The way the water loosens my hinges, turns my blood to opals, throws herself against me, purring like some wild beast, and I rest my head against her chest and listen to her heartbeat. Yes, now. Yes, now. The sun climbs the ridge in the morning and we howl together because it's good to be alive and say so. Tell it to the river. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And it, it's, it's like a ballad. You know, those yes. old time ballads that build and build and build yes. and build until you have an entire world in your heart and your hands through your ears. Beautiful. Beautiful. You got the music of that piece. Thank you. That it's is so correct. Right. And, I and, love that you named that ballad. I, 
I feel strongly that it comes from a very hard one place. Oh, yeah. A very hard one place. Oh yeah. And that it's your that it, you're giving voice to lived experience. Absolutely. In a way that enables you to live with that experience moving forward. Right. Like we talked about resilience before. Mm -hmm. You know, that mm -hmm. piece is the journey of resilience. You know, mm -hmm. to the point at the end where it comes to um howling with the river and with life yes. itself that it's yes. good to be alive and to say so and to yes. be able to voice it to say so yeah and to put put the death of your tender friend and then end with howling for the river i, I mean it's just beautiful it's absolutely right. beautiful tell me what the river means to you <laughs> wait there's words for that <laughs> <laughs> I live by two rivers and and I'm a river walker and a river swimmer and it I I want you to say what it means to you if you can't if you can't because you tell it to the river and that's something very very special it really is um yeah I just thought of another poem I could share about the river um so I grew up by a river I grew up by the Potomac River um in Maryland outside of Washington DC and that's where everything happened for me um that's where I felt safe um more safe than with people and I think that for Absolutely. me that's one of the big parts of my connection and immersion in nature is that I trusted nature to speak to me and show me um, truth and clarity and cleanness. Uh, whereas in my family, um, there were so many lies and so many, you know, sideways and behind the, you know, ne nothing was, was, there was never, never anything that was a straight shot. And so when I found nature, I would say nature found me and invited me in. Mm -hmm. um, I trusted nature and I learned mm -hmm. how to be human from the cycles of growth and death in nature. And, and then the river rivers teach me how to let go how to um how to flow how to be lithe how to be liquid um how to surrender how to change my shape um how exactly. to adapt yeah. and so for the last seven or eight years I've spent most of my summer camping about four feet from a river in Northern California. Uh, no tent, nothing, just on the ground. Uh, and my last two collections, I should grab them. Um, I wrote literally four feet from the water. Um, Yuba Witch, that's the name of the river, is the Yuba River. Yuba Witch and River Spells. And... Mm -hmm. um, and I sat with this river every day and every night and learned her and found reflection of myself and ways of, of being um, to answer my, some of my deepest questions. Why am I here? What matters to me? And what do I have to offer? Swirling yeah. eddies are so different. I grew up by a lake. And yeah. so when I was hurt, I would go lay in the lake and let the water pull all the pain out of me. And I would feel this, the edges of myself disappearing. And I would literally feel like I would become one with that lake. And then when I got into a river, what? It was completely different. The river doesn't just hold you. The river has momentum and motion and force and it moves you in a different way the lake 
allows a certain kind of cleansing, a certain kind of way. But the river is powerfully transformational. The first time I laid down and instead of just floating, I was going, I went, what is this? It's a completely different passion, completely different passion. I love how, how that poem gives us the idea of the river of your life, of how you're, you are the, you are the current flowing through all of these things that are happening to you and, and telling it to the river seems like the perfect metaphor for that. That's right. But it's not even a metaphor because it's more real than, I don't know how to say this. It's not like a comparative. It is what it is. Yeah. And it's so interesting. I love how you describe the difference between the lake and the river. And to me, the river is, is such a force. It's such a living being. I mean, like I name her in that piece. She, she is this great beating, purring beast that I'm able to, to, to lie my head against that breathing, flowing aliveness and connect with my own. And, and I think that what you're saying actually helps me understand another piece of that poem i love how you see the the river of my life in that piece and so i think what happens for me with the river is i take my life force back yes i, I too, yes i too am this living breathing purring alive creature i too am this no matter how much i've shut down in parts and in years of my life um that life is bigger, life force, flow, river is bigger than anything else. And I trust that part of me. I think that's the other piece that happens. Yeah, that happens for me in nature is I'm like, oh, okay, so, so this is how trees grow. And this is how how rivers move and this is how oceans wave and this is how skies change and suns set and moons rise and I am part of this so I too have cycles and I'm allowed to have cycles of fallow and cycles of high productivity and both are needed I am whole in this even when I shut down that is oh perfect. that's so that's so perfectly spoken. That is yeah. exactly the way I feel about it. Yeah, so perfectly spoken. And there, there, as I said, there are two rivers here. And sometimes, even as evolved as I as I think I am from time to time, I'll still have a terrible day. And the only thing that works is to throw myself into the river and just be there, and just and that cold and that shock. And that sharpness, and then it, it the cold kind of dissipates a little bit, and then it's gone, and I'm in the river, and it is a curative, it in a way that I cannot articulate, but you come pretty close <laughs> with, with what you're saying. I'm you come as of, close as I've ever heard to articulating what that's like. Yeah, I'm thinking of another poem. Um, of mine that you might love you ready for another poem definitely okay, Meredith, this... before you before you read sorry yeah. all this is yeah. becky speaking <laughs> yeah, i just becky. wanted to share a few comments that we've had um come in um just a lot of of praise and appreciation for the poetry that you've shared um and someone mentioned, you know, I love that we got to hear you speak it to us so powerful. And I want to echo that, that there's, there's reading poetry yourself, but there's also hearing the poet read their own poetry. And there was, there's such, um, such a rhythm to the way you read your, your poem, Meredith. And I think that has a lot, um, that, that adds a lot to it. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you so much for that feedback. I I love that, and and I so agree with you. Um, and and I think that ties into what Kayessa was saying about about naming that piece a ballad, 
mm-hmm. because there is a musicality and a rhythm. And again, in nature, I often write uh, at when I'm hiking. So I can take the skeleton of a piece, the skeleton of a poem and walk with it. And so I actually am writing it to my stride, to my heartbeat, to my breathing pattern. And this is, you know, how one of the ways I believe that each of us can find our writing voice that is so unique to us, our unique rhythm of being that comes through, um, especially when we read and share our piece. So I love that, that people are really getting that and feeling that. Yes. And and another person commented, they love the imagery of the edges of myself disappearing. Um, And then a a beautiful comment from someone who who said their prairie raised lakes were a treat we weren't allowed to enjoy. Streams and rainstorms and tornadoes, still a little bit of a storm lover, same here, (laughs) and still very much (laughs) next door to being a Pluviophile, water washes us clean when we're allowed to find rest in it. Water is good for us. That comment is a poem. (laughs) Totally. Water washes us clean. There you go. That's it. Um, Okay, I'm going to share this piece that that I hadn't thought to share, but I but it's right up. It's right up our river. It's called Huntress of the Holy Sound and, um, okay, Huntress of the Holy Sound. I sat by the river and I listened to the water. She was singing about forgiveness. She was singing about hunger. She was singing a song of sunlight as my body rolled under. I asked the rocks and I asked the water what to do about my hunger while I chewed on rinds of anger by the mouth of the river. She sat down beside me, touched my skin with her fingers. Shake out your bones, you wild creature. Shake out your bones, you wild dancer. Gather and empty your blood of what aches, and the moon will make her honey in the dark from your mistakes. I sat by the river and I listened to the water and her waves washed me over like the hands of the mother. I came clean to her gospel. I came hard to her thunder and her waves washed me over as my body rolled under. Put down your worries, lay your body down here at the river where the earth is hallowed ground. Put down your worries, lay your body down. The gospel of the water will unwind what is bound. Light a flame for forgiveness, light a flame for truth. Claim your worthiness for love, grow into your youth. Come home to the river, home to this sacred sound where the water sings your name in the secret language that you found. There are circles on the water playing prism with the light. There are rocks carved with faces who tell your fortune in the night. She will wrap you in her rapture, share her pockets, treasures deep and your tears will turn to temples in the healing of her heat. She'll sing a song of forgiveness in a hard-earned melody, and her music will absolve you of every wrongful deed. Whisper your prayers to the water, moan your desire to the moon, turn your wisdom into soil, seeds to plant, seeds to bloom. there it is it's the gospel (laughs) (laughs) Uh yeah that's what yeah that's perfect and she will wrap you in her rapture oh yes 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 yeah 
Oh, I just want you to keep reading. I just, I just love the sound of your voice as you join. Then I can feel it. I can feel the heartbeat so strongly in that one. That's right. It's beautiful. It's perfect. Love sharing it. And there are no words. I mean. I don't want to say anything about it. I just want it to live. Just, just want to go and vibrate like a river running through us. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. I love it. And it rolls you under. I can feel it in my heart. When you wrote that, did you feel it? I mean, it feels like you felt it as you wrote it. Do you do any rewriting, any editing, any? Do you, how does this come from? Um, it come, So my process is I get the first line as a gift from my muse, mm -hmm. but it's also a work permit. So, <laughs> or I, I should say a work demand. <laughs> so the first line is the <laughs> gift and then it's get to work, babe. So um, I write down the first line and, and then, and then it's work and, um, and I'm a rather meticulous editor. So um, I will get, you know, the first like whoosh yeah. of the piece and yeah. I, I take notes, you know, before it runs away, I say, you got to grab it by the tail, right? Before mm -hmm. it runs back into its wild place of living and um and then uh I edit like a mad woman um there are pieces that I've edited 200 times there's pieces I've edited for 20 years before they get published um yeah for me it, it's this process and I enjoy it I mean it's it's meticulous and I enjoy it um the the crafting and the shaping looking for exactly that to take the original feeling that um, is so big and so deep and to be able to, to recreate the shape so that it is, so that it transmits what it is so that exactly like you said, you feel it, you feel it humming and 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 moving and beating through you I want you to feel that and and to me there are these moments in editing um where suddenly you've got it and it comes into this alignment and it's almost like something in the universe rings and says that's it it could be nothing else this is it this communicates this feeling that is beyond words. And I think this is so much of what we do as creatives and as poets or any kind of, of tuning in creatively, opening ourselves a thousand percent while channeling it and shaping it exactly through the instrument the wild, bent, scarred, beautiful instrument that each of us has become. And it's a unique fingerprint. So um, that's a long way of saying I do a lot of editing to find the place where it rings true. And you're, it's, it's, I love the word instrument for that. And it's a scarred instrument. I think that's my thing. Well, I'm looking and we only have 10 minutes and I want to make sure that you get a chance to tell us about your new book. Oh, okay, great. Because don't you have a book that's coming out? I do. In February? So, Is it February? Yeah, it comes out the, thank you so much. It comes out the end of February. It's called Writing by Heart. And um, I am teaching workshops um, on Zoom to women all over the world now. And this book um, documents the last four years of these workshops, which have been such an amazing garden and community. And the way that we show up to write our pieces for ourselves, but then we are held 
in this hearth of witnessing and supporting and reflecting and resonating and the community and the bond that we have built in these workshops is amazing. So this book, Writing by Heart, um, invites other people into the writing invitations and how to, um, thanks Becky for putting that up, and how to um, show up with yourself and dig deep and find the treasure, their invitations, their doorways into you finding your treasure. And so um, this book will, you can pre-order it now. And if you want to be on my book launch team, um, I'm there. Yeah. Um, Kayes is on the team. You can pre-order the book and then we'll send you an advanced PDF copy um, early February. You'll read it and write a review for us. So if any, if that feels like a fun thing for anybody, you can um, be in touch with me. Um, and otherwise the book will be out the end of February. And then I have my first book, which I'm just going to um, go over here and grab. Wait till um, you see, wait till you see the title of the first book. You're just going to, I don't know if you can see this, but this is my first book that came out three years ago. That's called write a poem, save your life. And um, most people can relate to that. If you're if you're if you're yes. with us, you can probably relate to that. This tells a lot of my story of how I left home young and lost my voice and found my voice and um and how I was um that story I told about the epiphany I had of going for the hike and realizing, like so many of us, that what gives us such a deep sense of purpose and fulfillment is coming from the place where we were broken open and from this place broken, open. There's and a, from a this song. place what do we have to share so that's this book write a poem save your life i have a couple of poetry collections this again is invitations to write and um and then a couple of poetry books and um Maybe part of poetry, part of what I love about poetry is what happens when you share your poem with yeah. someone else and you can feel what they feel back to you. So the groups that you run are very much like that. I, I, I was I was blessed in school to have Vic Kintoski as a teacher. And there were just a couple of times where it felt like in the group, I understood what I'd been saying even better. <laughs> you know what I mean? I and do. There's so many poems that I've found that have shaped who I am. And I'll go back to them again and again and again. Um, their whole book, Stream of a Common Language by Adrian Rich and um, The Moon is Always Female by Marge Piercy and Movement in Black by Pat Parker. They're just poems that help you live and breathe more freely and feel more intensely. And when you read your poems, and when I read one of your poems, I have that. I have that sense of being understood in a part of myself that usually gets discounted, disregarded, or thrown to the side. And you get it. You get the intuitive significance of the connectedness to the natural world and you can your poems connect us back in to our own strongest self in a way that can only be done through pure authenticity and through really having done the work to know yourself that well, that yeah. well. And so it 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 awakens it awakens me to read your poetry. Awakens me, brings me more alive. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you. I love everything you said. I boil all of that down in complete understanding and agreement to say that poems, um, other people's as well as our own, are yes. maps. They are yes. maps home. And so when you write that poem that you journey through the chaos to a place of I'm back now. I've got myself. I can do this like the arrows in the quiver of your Orion piece. 
um, they become our maps because we're going to hit those places of challenge again. And the more yes. we learn to track ourselves and our process, the more accessible it is and the more quickly we can move through it knowing where we want to shoot for. And when right. where we want to shoot for is back home here. Mm -hmm. Here. And and healing is not a line. It's not a straight line. Okay, I felt bad and now I feel great. That does not happen. It is a spiral. And so the more we can write, the more we can revisit. You can feel this when you read a poem you wrote 20 years ago and it speaks to you in a totally new way. And you can feel how not you haven't, it's not that you've grown, it's that you've transformed that energy as you've moved forward through the rest of your life. We have just a couple of minutes. Were there any questions that we needed to address or anything like that, Becky? So no questions, but just some very um, heartfelt comments. Um, one that I, I definitely wanted to mention, uh, the person earlier who um, commented about being raised in the prairie and not having access to water as often. Um, I, I think both of you mentioned that that comment in itself was poetry. And uh, that person was deeply appreciative of that um, because they had been told that they could not write poems. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and then there's, you know, just also, you know, appreciation for, for what you read, what you've shared, um, love the personification of the river and the waves washing over me. So I could put down my worries of the hollow ground of the river, the forgiveness and worthiness of the river and the secret language, turn your wisdom to solid, to seeds, to plant the gospel. Yes. And, um, you know, your your word choices are heartfelt and brilliant. You speak from your soul. Uh, what what treasures and thanks to uh, Kayessa for having Meredith on today. And that um, the creative I love this line. The creativity and brain power is off the charts from you two speaking together. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Me it's too. just an honor. Me I, too. I, I, I want to make. I guess I want to make sort of an assignment for anyone listening. I would like for you to go deep into your heart center and write, 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 and see how it changes you and see how it emboldens you. I would like everyone who hears this to just write a poem. Just write a, a poem of what's happening. Of what they're feeling. Yeah. What's Just here? Because. Right now. Right now. <laughs> right, right now. What's here? <laughs> what does it feel like? Just describe. That's right. Do the senses. What do you hear? What do you see? What do you feel? Yeah. Yeah. How are you moved? How are you moved? How are you touched? Thank you so, Thank you so much. much. I have loved this. Can we do it again tomorrow? <laughs> Let's just keep doing it. Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Kayessa and Meredith. Just, I, I mean, I could honestly listen to you all speak all day long, every day. Really, I could. We will definitely have to do this again. Thanks, um, Becky, for having us. Thank you all to, you. to those of us who've joined us today and for your lovely comments. I know we didn't have an opportunity to, to read through all of them, but they were all just so heartfelt and um, we really appreciate them so much. Um, again, this has been recorded. So if there was anything that you missed or if you wanna share it with anyone, um, it will be available on the, the webpage uh, for Survivor Circles on Survivor Space. Um, it will also be on Zero Abuse Project's YouTube channel, um, so you'll be able to, to find it. So thank you all so much again for joining us. Have a, a lovely rest of your day. And remember, you're all poets. <laughs> Take thank care, you everyone. Thank so you so much. What an honor.
Thank you. Well, everyone, right, right, right. Right, right, right. That's right. Thank you all. Take care. Bye. Bye.